All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're, we're doing our first uh, live uh, Ask the Agronomist here with a live studio audience. So Lance Tarchioni, technical agronomist with the Cabin Asgro here with you. Thank you for joining online. Um, I, I'm not I'm not going to turn the camera around and embarrass the uh, the the invited studio audience here. But uh, Jennifer says I'm standing too close. So it's got my producer here giving me hand signals. So. <clears throat> Uh, we'll we'll kind of kind of lay out uh, what we're trying to do here, and we'll get we'll get going, and and hopefully this works. Would like your feedback for you know how this episode uh, seems from a online viewer standpoint, and uh, this is something that I've been wanting to do since we started doing Ask the Agronomist was have a live studio audience, a la uh, Tool Time, and uh, we we don't have uh, Chris Callal here with us this morning. I was joking with Jennifer that if Chris could be here. Uh, he he could be like a, a skinny owl, and I would be like a fat Tim. So we're we're kind of roles reversed there. But anyway, um, uh, we're hoping to get some interaction with the uh, the live audience here. Thanks to the uh, guys at the Linville Brant location for uh, hosting us. I'm I'm in my happy place here. I'm surrounded by DeKalb and Asgro seed with good customers and good dealers and, and a seed warehouse, and uh, having some nice breakfast here this morning. So. Sorry for those of you watching online, you're not getting the good breakfast that, uh, that Ross is uh, cooking up in the background there. But um, anyway, we're, we're, we're kind of hopeful that this works and that this works for both the in-person guests and the online viewer. I personally wouldn't mind uh, you know, having an Ask the Agronomist traveling roadshow that goes to a different venue you know, many times throughout the year. So. Uh, for those of you who are, are watching and thinking that you might be interested in doing something like this for your customers at your dealer location, you know, reach out to your FSR and we can set that up. Ross just took the initiative. To, he's the he's the guinea pig. He was first. I actually thought Jennifer's dad uh, might be the first to to do this because he had asked about it as well. But uh, Ross was the was was the first. So hopefully, first of many to come. Uh, as as always. I would much prefer to talk about, you know, what's on your all's mind here in the in the live audience today. If you've got questions, please uh, please don't be bashful about asking. Um, I, and Jennifer is going to try to remind me to repeat the question because uh, for those of you who are nervous about people online hearing you from where you're sitting, unless you're shouting, they probably won't even be able to hear you ask a question. So if uh, I will repeat the question for the for the online viewers. We can certainly talk about uh, the spring, you know, fall burn down, woulda, shoulda, coulda. If you, if you didn't, if you did do fall burn down, looks great. If you didn't, looks pretty, but it's kind of the, the, the pretty is kind of problematic in some cases. So, so we can talk about weed control. We can talk about planting dates. We can talk about crop that's already in the ground. Um, we can talk about, uh, you know, if, if you have been being patient and, haven't planted anything yet. I, I think that's a good thing. I was teasing uh, some of the folks on the team here recently with the, the rainfall we've had. You know, we had all that beautiful weather in February and we had all that beautiful weather in March and we had soil conditions that were perfect for planting for probably two or three weeks this year when it was really too early to be planting. And now that we're getting into the window when you'd like to plant, it's wet. And I, and I get the irony and frustration of that. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm anticipating within about, you know, a day or two, uh, panic will be setting in with some people that, oh, my God, it's going to be a late spring. And, you know, what, what are we going to do? So we, we tend to, to get to that point too quickly. And I, I personally wish we didn't live in fear of planting, you know, in late May as much as we do. Uh, I don't think it's ideal to wait till, you know, the middle of May to, to plant. But if we're still planting the middle of May, that doesn't mean we're bad farmers. It might actually mean we're better farmers. And uh, there's, there's really nothing to fear if you're not done planting by the 1st of May. So we can talk about that as we, as we get along. Uh, the Brant crew that's here may have some questions they wanna ask. Jennifer, feel free to speak up. And, and as always, if we get live questions coming in on the chat, uh, shout that out, Jennifer, so we can, uh, so we can address those. So, Everybody's got some moisture. I guess I'll, I'll go around the room here. Any, how much have you guys had in the last week-ish? One six. One six. One four. One four. Two point one. Okay. Two point one. I'm I'm at about one seven. 
at home. So home for me, by the way, is about two hours straight north of here. Um, I, I go, I've been around Jacksonville a lot um, because I've gone to St. Louis a lot over the last 30 years. And generally I go down 78 to get to 67 here and then down to Alton. So when I get to Jacksonville, I'm about two thirds of the way to, to St. Louis. So uh, that's, that's where we're coming to you live from today is the west of, just west of Jacksonville. So, uh, so lots of lots of similar rainfall amounts, and I would say as you go north up into my geography, pretty similar amounts. Um, there were areas uh, what, south, southeast of Springfield, I think, is where the you know some of the heaviest stuff was, three, four inch amounts. I've I've heard. So, you know, everybody's had a you know a, a good amount of rain. For those that were scared about how dry we were going into spring, personally. I prefer a dry spring. I, I would much rather have a dry spring and count on timely rains through the growing season rather than have extra in the spring because you can't store a year's worth of moisture anyway. And extra in the spring does no good for nobody. Um, so, I, you know, when, when people are nervous about it being too dry in the spring, you know, we, we raise some of our best crops when we start out too dry. Uh, when we start out too wet, that, that tends to be a much bigger deal for us. This isn't, this isn't like the West where you got to get your six or seven inches of rain because that's all you're going to get for the rest of the season. You know, we, we really rely on timely rains. No matter how recharged the soil moisture is when we start, we're going to have to have timely rains in July and August to raise the kind of crop we want. And, and last year was kind of the perfect example of that. I mean, we went with next to nothing until – you know, late June to early July and still raised a hell of a crop in spite of the fact that it looked like it was going to die um, on June 29th. That's when the derecho went through um, that that date will <clears throat> I'll probably I, I don't remember things as well as I used to, but I think June 29th, 2023 will will stick out in my mind. I was actually at a field day at WIU when the storm sirens went off. It's kind of a funny story. I was out there at a field day with 50 growers who thought their crop was lost because we were in a drought. And so we all agreed when it started, you know, we, we started getting alerts on our phones that there were storms in the area. And we all agreed that none of us were leaving the field until we were all soaked because we wanted it to rain. Um, you know, when, when Macomb started to blow away and the storm sirens started going off, we decided that maybe we better get a new plan and we, we got out of there and the derecho swept through and I tried to get home. I tried to beat it home and I didn't realize it was going 70 mile an hour. So basically I just drove in the eye of the hurricane all the way home because I couldn't go faster than, than it was going. But uh, that kind of started the wet part of our year. S some people in the wet part of their season got two inches of rain in July, which two inches of rain in July is half a normal wasn't what you wanted, but it was enough to get you by. Other places had 10 inches of rain in July. And, and if you look at the performance of the crop last year, you know, it, it was directly correlated to how much rain you got in July and August and how dry you were in June really had no bearing whatsoever on how good or bad your, your crop was in a lot of cases. So it was a good illustration that, you know, a corn plant is doing important things when it's small to set its yield potential, but it doesn't take a lot of moisture to enable it to do what it needs to do when it's small. And it's really hard to reduce the yield potential of a corn plant by stressing it pre-tassel. Stress after tassel is where we lose yield. So if you look at years like 1983, 1988, 1989, 2012, what, what do those years all have in common? almost no rain in July. And, and that actually is about the only thing that on a national scale correlates to yield and corn. Planting date does not. Fertility does not. You know, lots of other things that we worry about a lot. If you look nationally at the, how, how good a crop do we have, the amount of rain you get in July is the biggest overall factor in corn. And, and last year was a good illustration of that because lots of bad things happened until July. And from July on, we really had a pretty good growing season. 
And, and, and that's what enabled us to raise the crop that we raised. I've, I've talked to some growers that have what I would almost consider to be a false sense of security that with today's management practices and today's genetics, we can't fail after what you went through last year. Um, you know, if we'd have had to wait two or three more weeks to get that first rain, I, I think a lot of people would have been shocked at how bad their crop would have been relative to what it ended up being. You know, we, we were on track to have another 2012. And, and, and I think it's still possible to have, you know, another 2012. I, I argue that, you know, 100 is the new zero. You know, I, I don't know that you'll ever have a complete crop failure, but with what you've got invested in the crop and how high the stakes are in the game we're playing these days, a hundred bushel yield today probably isn't any better than zero was in 1988. You know, the one difference would be you got better crop insurance backing you up today than you did then. But, you know, I, I, I still think we can have a crop failure. It's just we keep raising the bar on what's a failure. You know, I, I you know, when I started my career, I probably would have never expected that I'd ever get an ass chew in over 240 bushel corn. I've had ash chewings over 240 bushel corn because when you see 280, 290, 300, or you hear about somebody making three something, 240 doesn't feel as good as it used to. So we keep raising the bar, you know, soybeans probably even more than corn. You know, how many of you used to be tickled to death if you cut some 60 bushel soybeans? 50. 50, you know, my, my dad, funny story about my dad. My, my dad retired from farming about 15 years ago. My dad will admit he was never a, you know, cutting edge, um, you know, leader in technology kind of farmer. He was pretty old fashioned, you know, in, in his day when he was farming. And, and he always thought that anybody that beans made over 40 must have been a liar. And, and he works at an elevator now, part time dumping trucks in the fall. And, and two guys that he knows and trusts that are honest told him what their beans made. And when he got home from work that night, he called me and he said, uh, you know, a couple guys that I don't think were lying told me their beans made, they were in the 80s for like field average yields. He goes, is that possible? I said, oh yeah. I said, that's not actually all that uncommon. And, and that's when he told me that story. I always thought anybody with beans made 50 was lying. Um, so, so we've really raised the bar on what we expect out of our soybeans. We, you know, our yield contests the last two years, you know, the winners of that contest been over a hundred. Um, you know, if you're going to, you know, we have guys that raise 290 or 299 bushel corn that don't bother to enter a yield contest because they know they're not going to win. And what's the point? It didn't make 300. Soybeans, you know, if it doesn't make a hundred, we got guys that eh, well, somebody's going to beat me because they, they didn't make a hundred. So the stakes are pretty high. The bar set pretty high. Our expectations are pretty high. There's not a product in this warehouse we're setting in here today that can't make 300 bushel of corn and a hundred bushel of beans. It's just a matter of, do we have the right management? Do we get the right weather? Um, and, and do the stars align so that we can achieve those kind of yields and you know, like I said, the stakes, the stakes keep getting higher. You know, you used to, you know, you used to really be able to celebrate 70 bushel beans and 240 bushel corn. And, and unfortunately the world we're in today, you know, you, you'd be below your break even in some scenarios with those yields. And, that, and that's kind of sad in a way to me, but it's, it, it's the world, it's the world we're in. So anyway, uh, anybody brave enough to start with the first question here today? Yes, sir. Awesome. Got a question. So we're talking about the yield of the beans and the corn. Uh -huh. If a guy were to set up his plan, what would you plant first to feel comfortable about to probably make more money? Okay, so good question. And to repeat the good question, it, if you want to plant one crop at a time, or if you want to start planting, which crop would you start planting with? And what has the, and, and correct me if I get this wrong, which crop has the better odds of success from being planted early corn or beans? So I, I would say we still live in a culture where timely planting of corn is the most important to people. All the data 
says that we should focus on soybeans with early planting. Um, and all the data says there's not a damn thing wrong with planting corn May 15th. Now, some of you sitting in here uh, probably feel more pressure than I do to be timely planting. I mean, we're, get, we're getting pretty close to the racehorse flats part of the, of the state where, you know, if you're not done planting corn by May 15th, somebody might take a farm away from you. Um, I mean, the, the pressure to get corn planted early is, is pretty intense. Um, we've put pressure on both corn and soybean planting early in recent years. The trend has certainly been we've moved soybean planting up a lot and corn planting probably hasn't moved up much in the last 20 years compared to soybean planting. So we've probably moved soybean planting up maybe a month in the last 20 years. Corn planting probably hasn't changed a lot maybe a few days. What has changed dramatically in the last 20 years is how fast you can plant, how many acres you can plant. Now, as, as farm size increases, you know, I would argue a lot of people have probably always, with good weather and no breakdowns, been able to plant their entire crop in 10 days. You could do that in 1972. You could do that in 1982. You could do that in 1992. You can do it. You can do it today. Just the only difference is you did 800 acres in 10 days, and now you do 8,000 acres in, in 10 days. Um, but we can we can all plant pretty fast. People worry about you know the risk. There's always bad days to plant, right? And and on a bad you know in the old days on a bad day you got 100 acres planted, so you had a 100 acre problem. Today you might plant 1,000 acres a day, and you got a 1,000 acre problem if that was a bad day to plant. Now, I would argue that as a percentage of your total operation, a thousand acres today may not be any more than a hundred acres was at some point in history. So relatively speaking, I'm not sure it's changed, but the, 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 the stakes feel higher because you can cover so many acres in a day. But back, back to the good question that was asked, um, there's lots of data to support that soybeans planted in April will out yield soybeans planted in May. Now there is no data that I have seen. Now there could be a location here or there, but if you look at replicated studies over years across locations, I've never, I've never seen one that says March soybeans will beat April soybeans. This March soybean thing's getting a little out of hand in, in my opinion. Um, but you know, they, they will survive and they will yield well, but they typically won't yield as well as April planted soybeans. So, so to me, the soybean window should be, you know, early April to early May. And the corn window should be second or third week of April until late May. Yes, sir. What rate would you plant soybean oh, early? good question. Good question. Dealers, close your ears. Uh, the earlier you plant your soybeans, the thinner I would plant them. So uh, soybean population seeding rates have come down steadily over the years. A lot of that due to seed treatment. You know, when we used to plant untreated beans, if you've ever wondered, is that, is that $20 seed treatment I'm buying or in some cases $30 seed treatment I'm buying, is that really worth it? Well, plant some naked beans in March or early April and do a, a treatment side by side. It will make you feel a lot better in the investment you're making in seed treatment. Um, now, as soybean planting gets later, the benefit, the need for treatment goes down. But I, I honestly think one of the biggest benefits of seed treatment is because it enables early planted soybeans. We're, we're not increasing yield potential that much because of the treatment compared to planting date. But without the treatment, you can't take advantage of the early planting. They, they just won't make it. It's it's crazy the difference seed treatment makes in some of these early planted bean trials. I've seen guys do side-by-sides of treated versus untreated on like a late March planting date. It's like full stand versus nothing comes up. It, it is that dramatic. Um, now, as you get later in the season, it gets warmer. The difference is, is not that great. But to answer your question, you know, seeding rate in soybeans that I recommend typically somewhere between 110 and 140, depending on the variety of the planting date, the soil type, um, you know, I don't vary it much on row spacing. The only caveat to that would be if you're still using a drill, 
and you know that you got a little bit of a slot factor there that you have to account for. But if you're using a planter and it is well set and it is doing what it's supposed to be doing and you've got a good seed bed and it's fit to be planting, I don't think there's a need to ever plant more than 140 unless we get late. And, and, and what is late? You know, May 20th feels late today, but that is not late enough that you need to be jacking up your soybean seeding rate. So until we get into June, I wouldn't vary from that 110 to 140 range. What's optimum for harvest? 80 to 100. So question was, if you didn't hear it, what's the optimum final stand population for, for harvest? Um, you know, the kid that just raised, what was it, 200 and 206 point something bushel beans in Georgia, planted those at 70. Now, that's a, a different environment that he's got. You know, I wouldn't encourage planting beans at 70, but, you know, po population and yield in soybeans don't have much of a correlation. Planting date does, you know, obviously other management practices do, but, you know, we've, we've done planting dates or planting population studies for years, and, and you'll see some years 80 is the best, some years 160 is the best. The difference between vest and last is probably two or three bushels in most population studies. So, so that, that year where 160 beats 80, it beat it by two bushels, not 20. So you typically don't see big swings in soybean yield based on population. Something's always going to be the best. Something's always going to be last, but you know, if the best makes 92 and the last makes 85, you know, that's not a, a, a big, a big mover typically. Good questions. What else? Does row spacing change your opinion on population? So does row spacing change my opinion on population? I would say no with the caveat of, of the drill. So I don't think there's any data that I've ever seen that really supports that 15 inch rows need to be thicker than 30s. One of the reasons guys went back to 30s in some cases when seed got expensive was because we raised our seeding rates in 15 inch row beans. And so most people in their head thought that they had to plant thicker in 15 inch rows. And so they went away from 15 inch rows to save money on seed going back to 30s, which they thought they could plant thinner. I, I don't know that I've ever seen any what I consider to be repeatable data that says that there's any correlation between row spacing and population in soybeans. Now, I have seen some studies that indicated that whatever was the best seeding rate at that particular location in that particular year was the best seeding rate in all row spacings. So, you know, as long as your planter, you know, 30 inch rows come up the best, 30 inch rows plant the best, 30 inch rows don't deal with old corn stalk rows, uh, 30 inch rows, you know, there's, there's advantages to 30 inch rows. I, I don't like 30 inch row beans, but I understand why people do. Um, so, so I would say a 30 inch row bean planter, you're probably going to get the highest percentage of the seeds you put in the ground to turn into a plant versus 15s or certainly versus a drill. So, so you may have a few more seeds that, that don't survive if you're planting something less than 30, but assuming you're doing an equally good job planting, I would have the same seeding rate, whether I'm on 15s, 20s, or 30s. What else, guys? Those, th th those, who, those who know me know that uh, not asking questions won't keep me from talking. It's just, it's just, I'd prefer to talk about the stuff that's on, on your mind rather than, and I don't know, I don't think we've had anything on the chat, Jennifer, so. What insect issues do you anticipate going into spring with? Um, so question is in, insect pressure uh, expectations. Every time we have a warm winter, you know, people talk about, you know, where we're gonna have more bugs, more diseases, you know, is the soil gonna work right? You know, people seem to have a, an idea that if, if it's not, cold and we don't have a lot of frozen soil through the winter that something bad's going to happen. Um, there's not a lot of reason to feel that way, in my opinion. Um, most of our insects that we deal with 
um, either migrate in, and so our winter doesn't matter, or they can handle cold winters, wet winters, dry winters, warm winters. It, it doesn't matter to them that much. So, you know, there are some insects that we don't worry about that much, like flea beetles and soybean aphids and some of that kind of stuff that can benefit from, from warm winters. Um, there are also insects, and this is probably a little more of a concern potentially, that like green fields in the spring. And they don't mind the purple ones either. So, so if you're a cutworm moth looking for a place to lay eggs where you think your offspring are going to have a good life, you're looking for green fields. So, you know, cover crop fields and fields with the native winter annual cover crop growing in them are going to be more attractive to cutworms, possibly wireworms. Uh, manured ground tends to be more, have more of a wireworm issue and some of those secondary pests. Uh, a lot of our seed treatment insecticides do a pretty good job suppressing, you know, some of those critters. Um, you know, from a rootworm standpoint, rootworm don't really care that much. Um, so I, I don't know that I anticipate, you know, from a, from a insect standpoint, you know, other than possibly cutworms because of all the early green up we had and, and whether it's winter annuals that we didn't control or a cover crop that we established on purpose, you know, there's a lot more green fields out there these days in the spring. Um, now, that tends to kind of spread them out. If you're the only guy with a green field, you know, you may get everybody's cutworm moths. If everybody's got a green field, then they're going to kind of end up scattered around everywhere. So, you know, it, it may not make that big of a difference. But um, and from a, from a disease standpoint, diseases probably even more than insects are dependent upon weather through the growing season a lot more than the winter. I mean, winter's not going to kill tar spot. Winter's not going to kill gray leaf spot. Winter's not going to kill northern leaf blight. Winter would kill southern rust, but it blows up from the south every every year that we have a southern rust problem. So, you know, I, I would argue that winter winter time weather with the pests that we deal with, you know, a, a really rough winter isn't going to wipe out everything. And a really mild winter is not going to make everything just automatically worse. So I, I don't know that it makes that much difference. And even from a, a soil tilth standpoint and how the soil works in the spring, you know, e even that, you know, what, what the soil needs to be good in the spring. Anybody know what that is? What's the soil need to be good in the spring? I'm looking for one word. It starts with a D. Dry. Dry. Thank you. So, so anytime soil conditions are optimal from a moisture standpoint we have good tilth we have good you know stuff works up good stuff plants nights everything works good I, I don't think you know no matter how much freezing and thawing you had in the winter if it's a little muddy in the spring it's not going to work good I, I was at uh, new berlin two weeks ago for our last ask the agronomist and when i went home from new berlin i drove past the field and I don't know if they'd done some tiling in this field. I, they may have had a good reason why it got worked in the mud, but I mean, it was, it had been hit with some sort of vertical till tool that, you know, they never do any harm. Right. And, and it was slabbed like it was, you know, worked with an old disc. And, and I kind of chuckled to myself. I'm sure that guy thought that soil was fit when he was out there. Um, so sometimes what we call fit is not really that fit. And, and how many of you have ever heard somebody say, maybe you've even used the saying yourself, you know, need to open it up to dry it out. You know, try not to do that. If, if it needs opened up to dry it out, that means it's too wet to work. Like, yes, ma'am. Okay, cool. So Matt Innes is questioning, are soils being used ahead of the average? And what are the concerns of corn rootworm populations for 2024 after seeing them moving farther south in the last three years? Okay, so good question, Matt. Thank you. So when when we talk GDUs to um, emergence and when we talk GDU accumulation, I'm not really aware of anybody who does that based on soil temperature. It's all air temperature that drives our GDU calculations. Now, if you use soil temperature, it would be different. 
It wouldn't be as different as you might think. The soil doesn't get as warm in the day. It doesn't get as cold at night as the air temperature. So all of our GDU recommendations and data are based on air temperature. And so if you did base it off soil temperature, we would have to recalibrate some stuff because it would change things. So, so I don't really distinguish between soil GDUs and air GDUs. They are correlated to each other. If the air doesn't have any GDUs, the soil will not have any GDUs. I mean, you can't, you're not going to have cold soil or cold air and warm soil. You might for a short time, if the soil was warm, air temperature drops fast, the soil is going to retain some heat for a few days. But on the flip side of that, the first day it's 80, when it's been 40, what's the soil temperature? 42. <laughs> so, so the soil retains heat when it gets cold. The soil retains cold when it gets warm and, and they, and they tend to move together. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about the, the thing that soil temperature influences is how many days is it going to take for that seed to get out of the ground? Because it is true back, back to Matt's question, the seed in the soil in the spring doesn't know how warm the air is. It only knows how warm the soil is. Now, all the warmth in the soil comes from the sun and the air. So if it's cold outside, the soil is going to be cold too. But that seed is, is really only experiencing the soil temperature. And so what, what we really worry about is based on when we plant, and we've actually developed a, a really nice tool I haven't really, Cal and I haven't really rolled this out to the sales team yet. Maybe shame on us for not doing this. And I'll, and I'll tell you why I haven't, honestly. We've developed a really neat tool that looks at soil temperature, current soil temperature, looks at the weather forecast, and predicts how many days it's going to take from an individual day to accumulate enough GDUs for emergence. And based on that, it makes a recommendation, is today a good day to plant or not? Now, I jokingly contend none of you care what that tool says because you're going to do what you want based on how you feel and what the neighbors are doing. But, but if you truly do care about, okay, on this date, how many days based on, and the other reason you don't care is, I mean, how good is the 10 day out weather forecast? You know, that, who knows? So we, our, our ability of this tool to predict the future is only as good as the long range weather forecast we're using to inform the tool. So, <clears throat> it, it, and the other trend that has been going on pretty strong last 20 years is that people care less about calendar date, people care less about soil temperature, and people care less about the weather and they're focused on what are my soil conditions right now when I'm ready to plant. And, and, the, and the school of thought that if it's fit when you plant, most of that other stuff doesn't matter too much is pretty prevalent these days. And if you're driven by soil conditions and soil conditions alone, the information we use to build this model don't mean much to you. But the reality is the longer it takes for your corn to come up, the less yield potential it's likely to have. And that's not because it loses yield potential in an individual plant. It's because it gets more uneven. You can have the best, most expensive, most awesome planter in the world. You can have the best soil conditions you've ever had. You can have perfect Seed spacing, you can have perfect, perfect seed depth, you can have perfect seed to soil contact, every seed in the field. Every seed in the field is slightly different, and every seed in the field is experiencing a different environment. The seed here might be half a degree warmer than his neighbor. And half a degree over three weeks might turn into two days difference in emergence. The faster it comes up, the more uniform it's going to be. The slower it comes up, the more ununiform it's going to be. And the slower it comes up, the more likely you are to lose plants. 
you're going to lose a few weak ones. You're going to lose a few to disease. You might lose a few to a wire worm. Your, your stand is not going to be as good. You know, when, when, when Randy Dowdy talks about corn coming up in four days in February in Georgia with 63 degree soil temperatures, I'm sorry, you can't have 63 degree soil in February. So you, you can't necessarily get the full benefit of planting early in corn because it's probably going to take a toll on the quality and the health of your stand. In theory, if we could plant corn April 1st and get it up in four days and have a perfect stand, it would probably out yield May 5th planted corn pretty consistently because it's going to have better weather during the reproductive stage because it's ahead. And June weather is better than July weather, and July weather is better than August weather on average. And you've got the potential to capture more sunlight by using more of the growing season. But when you plant corn on April 1st, and you plant corn on May 5th, and there's only four days difference in emergence date, that's going to give the advantage to the May 5th corn because it came up faster and I would bet you nine times out of 10, it's gonna be more uniform and un stand uniformity. And I'm talking about uniformity of size, not uniformity of spacing. No disrespect to the planter industry, spacing ain't near as damn important as we make it out to be. What's important is that they're all the same size at the same time. If these two seeds are three inches apart and then it's six inches to the next one and then the next ones are four inches apart and then one after that's five inches apart, your standard deviation on your spacing is going to suck and you'll raise really damn good corn as long as they're all the same size. Now, if everything's perfect and you're going against David Hula for 600 bushel corn, they better be spaced perfect too. So the higher you raise your yield goal, the more important other things become. If you're raising 250 bushel corn, spacing is pretty irrelevant. If you're raising 450 bushel corn, spacing is going to be more important. Uniformity is important, I think, at, at all yield levels. And when I say uniformity, I mean, I want, I want all these plants at V2. I want all these plants at V3. I want all these plants at V4. I want them to be the same size. And, and where, you know, where a lot of guys catch people who side, how many side dressers in the room? Any side dressers in the room? So, so guys that side dress their corn at V3, V4, they're the ones that, I mean, you're kind of scouting every acre when you're doing that. You're not going super fast. And it's really easy to see non-uniform stands at V3 because that V3 plant and that V1 plant at V3 very noticeable difference. At V10, a V10 standing next to a V8, they look about the same. You'd have to dissect the plant and take it apart to actually tell that there's two leaves difference in that plant. But at V3, you know, that one that is a spike standing next to the one that's got four leaves on it, you know, even I can see, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's different. So guys that side dress tend to tend to notice that stuff a lot more. Now there's also a, one, one a, an, an, an old adage that it kind of got started from some U of I research and it was, and the research was really misinterpreted. H how many of you've heard if it's two leaves behind, it's a weed. Yeah. Mo most of you. Um, that's actually not what the research says. What the research says was at two leaves behind measurable yield losses occur. So a two leaf behind corn plant is not a weed. You're better off that it's there. Now it might be a 200 bushel corn plant and the one beside it that's two leaves ahead might be a 260 bushel corn plant. But if you replace that two leaf behind plant with, a, with a, an empty space, your yield's going to go down versus having the two leaf behind plant. Now the, the argument is and this is something that I'm a little bit afraid of. If people keep planting early because we can't help ourselves, and at the same time, 
people understand the, the importance of a perfect stand and they start to get more comfortable with, well, May planted corn's not a disaster. Are you all going to want to tear up 32,000 because it's a little ratty and start over again? You know, that sounds a little crazy, but I, I know the last two years, you know, there, there are a lot of fields that an uneven 32 that struggled if you'd have just started over again, you'd have probably added 30 bushel to that field. You know, and I, and I don't want to start doing that, honestly, but I, but I do think that some of us probably need to be a little more aggressive about considering replants. Um, you know, the seed industry's made it really easy with, with pretty generous policies on replant. And the insurance industry has made it really easy with very generous policies on replant. So it, it's, it's a little hard to argue, you know, if you're making money replanting, um, what, what, why would you give up anything? You know, the biggest challenge is, and, and this year's a good example of this, you won't get the same hybrid the second time. So I would say take pretty good care of what you got the first time because the hybrid you get for the replant isn't going to be as good as the one you had the first time. So I, I would much rather do it right the first time and not have to replant. But you know, when you look at things like crown rot and you look at the impact of early season stress and you look at the impact of an uneven stand and you look at the impact of some missing plants and you look at the impact of unhealthy roots, stands that struggle have all of those bad characteristics and all of those things detract yield. I, I looked at a field of corn several years ago, and I and I didn't I, I didn't I didn't know any better at the time, so I encouraged him to leave the field. Um, that stuff had been through hell, uh, and and the radical root had died on almost, I'd say probably three fourths of the plants. The plant was alive; the rest of the root system was healthy, but but the radical had had died. The radical roots, the first root of the corn plant, it's it's kind of the, the the it's the first thing that emerges even before the shoot. It's the oldest part of the corn plant, and it's the part of the corn plant that gets the rest of the plant off to a good start. Once the rest of the roots are established, you, you could live without that. You could cut it off with a pair of scissors, and and that plant would survive. Now it's going to be stressed, but you know when it when it dies due to you know seedling blight. Um, you know, that's a pretty good indication that that plant has been through some tough times and, and looking back with the knowledge we've gained over the last 10 years that, you know, that would be an easy tear it up and start over again recommendation. If, if those plants, you know, if, if parts of their roots have rotted off and died and you've got a mediocre stand and you're trying to decide, is this worth leaving or not? You know, I used to really be a, bird in the hand over two in the bush kind of guy. And if you've got 28,000, you can live with, I'd stay with that rather than starting over again. But kind of back to that, you know, we keep raising the stakes on this, you know, 28,000 can yield 220 really easy, but it ain't going to make 280. And a perfect 35 planted May 10th can still make 280. So, you know, is it worth starting over again, trying to move forward 60 bushel in yield potential? Knowing that it's, there's no guarantee you're gonna get that extra 60 bushel. Now, I don't think you'll ever go backwards replanting that marginal leavable stand on May 5th or May 10th, but there's no guarantee you're gonna gain either. Thank you. I want to cover off on the corn rootworm. Mm. Yep. Thank you. I, I distract myself by talking too much. So rootworm. So so the, the gentleman that asked the question is uh, is a dealer of ours that I know well. Uh, his family farms in the Gelsberg area. So he is he is a lot closer to rootworm central than you guys are. So so for the folks sitting here in Jacksonville, I wouldn't even think about rootworm unless you're doing continuous corn or second or third year corn. If you're on rotated ground, I think you could ignore rootworm. Rootworm don't, don't mean squat to you guys. Um, as you move north in Illinois and as you move east in Illinois, 
rootworm get more important on you know on every acre. Northern Illinois um, has really never gotten a reprieve from rootworm. So if you remember how bad we were fighting rootworm in 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, it's been that way in Northern Illinois ever since then. And th those guys still battle heavy, 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 heavy pressure from rootworm. Um, largely due to the fact that they do a lot more corn on corn than we do as a, as a, as a rule. Um, most producers in the central Illinois, you know, tend to be primarily rotated. So the rootworm pressure in Northern Illinois has always been heavier and, and rootworm pressure in Northern Illinois, you know, is, is pretty intense. Um, e even today, there's guys up there, um, you know, the switch rapidly to smart stacks pro because it gives the highest level of, of trait protection and, and it's really, really good. People that are still using smart stacks in some cases are using a full rate of a soil applied insecticide on top of smart stacks and still not satisfied with the level of root protection they're getting from that. So that kind of gives you an idea of what the rootworm pressure is north, north versus, versus here. Um, I would say indications are from all the sampling that we've done that no matter where you are in Illinois, if you're on the rotated acre, the odds of you having heavy rootworm pressure are extremely low. So on rotated ground, you know, even in, you know, the northern part of central Illinois, I, I would not be terribly concerned about rootworm. Um, the trend is the more years of continuous corn you have, the, the worse potential you have. So third year corn should be worse than second year corn. Fourth year corn should be worse than third year corn. It, it does kind of tend to build. So second year corn can be pretty bad or it can be not bad at all. It kind of varies. Uh, so as you move north, I would say if you're doing corn on corn, your odds of having heavy rootworm pressure increase. Um, I, I have never been a fan of trying to identify corn on corn acres with low enough rootworm pressure that I don't need root protection. I, I think that's a, a dangerous game to play because we can't predict where rootworm are going to show up. We know that geographically there's, there's hot spots in the state where you're a lot more likely to run into rootworm, you know, and I'd say Illinois North of interstate 80 would fall into that category from interstate 80 to interstate 74. Um, it's, higher risk than what you guys deal with, but I would say still moderately low risk. And if you get south of 74, for sure, south of 72, um, you know, it's, you know, the, the way 74 and 72 run, it depends on what side of the state you're on, how close 74 and 72 are. Uh, two different worlds on the west side of the state, the east side of the state, it's kind of the same world. Um, so I got to be a little bit careful when I, when I make that analogy. But generally, 72 south, you know, rootworm, not a thing. 72, 74, up to 80 could be a thing. North of 80, it is a thing, you know, every year, almost every field. Um, but we are seeing, uh, again, to Matt's question, we are seeing a consistent trend that rootworm pressure does get a little worse every year. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to be worried about that here. But, but that's over a general landscape, huge areas of Nebraska, huge areas of Iowa, a lot of Minnesota, and a lot of Northern Illinois, rootworm's pretty bad. And, and in the bad places, they keep getting worse, and the bad places tend to be expanding a little bit. But you guys are far enough away from the bad, I wouldn't worry about that. You might get to someday, but someday's not here yet. Like, without sounding like a commercial, I know that there's some 11499 here in this shit that some of these guys have on their acres. So do you maybe want to discuss the very degrees of protection that we offer in a bag? Like I said, I know we try to avoid sounding like a commercial, but right. it's a perfect time to right. discuss those. Well, problems. you know, when the FSR sound like a commercial, sometimes the TA can't stop that. So that, that's okay. <laughs> My job. <laughs> So, uh, so Jennifer's talking about uh, what, what we call VT4 Pro. So VT4 Pro is our newest rootworm option. And it's being added to the current rootworm options of SmartStacks Pro and SmartStacks. So we've got three levels of rootworm protected corn within DeKalb. 
There is the SmartStacks product that you're that you've used for years that everybody's pretty familiar with. Dual, dual mode of action, tried, true, uh, dependable. You know, people are comfortable with those hybrids, comfortable with that trait. Like I already said, in Northern Illinois, it's not good enough anymore. You know, you 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 know, we we sell very little SmartStacks corn in Northern Illinois today. Most of it's already switched to SmartStacks Pro. And SmartStacks Pro is we inserted our new RNAi trait, the first non-BT rootworm trait, into SmartStacks. So it's a three-way stack rootworm product. Full strength, best rootworm protection on the market, bar none, best one we have, best one in the industry. So if you want to be loaded for bear against rootworm, SmartStacks Pro is what you want to plant. BT4 Pro is kind of a unique stack. We pull Herculex rootworm out and getting away from Herculex rootworm has been a desire of almost everybody in corn breeding and corn genetics because it's hard to make high yielding corn if you've got that Herculex rootworm trait in that hybrid. It, it does, you know, I, I, I hate the term yield drag, um, but generally speaking, corn does yield more if you pull that trait out of the hybrid, but it is a very effective rootworm trait. So if, if rootworm are present, you want that trait there because it helps control rootworm. If rootworm are not present, you don't want that trait there because it's probably holding back the yield of the hybrid a little bit. So what VT4 Pro is, we take the new RNAi trait, which is in SmartStacks Pro, we pull out the Herculex rootworm. So we're back to a two mode product and the two modes that are in VT4 Pro for rootworm are the old Monsanto yield guard rootworm trait from many, many, many years ago, which is one of the traits in SmartStacks with the newest RNAi. So it's the oldest trait and the weakest of the three with the newest trait, the strongest of the three and we take out the Herculex rootworm, which is the trait in the middle. And then above ground, VT4 Pro is Tricepta. So it has the same above ground um, insect protection as Tricepta hybrids do. So really good above ground. And it has good, but not as good as SmartStacks Pro, rootworm protection below ground. And it's really designed, I think, perfectly for the parts of central Illinois where people are still kind of afraid of rootworm and they want some protection, but they don't want to sacrifice any yield potential to get it. And so we think VT4 Pro could kind of become a big thing for us in central Illinois because it has probably the right level of rootworm protection for us with no yield penalty versus a double pro or its receptor. So over time, I think we'll release a lot more VT4 Pro hybrids, and I think that could become kind of a popular thing. Um, we've also got uh, a really unique seed treatment package on VT4 Pros. So because we know that the rootworm protection is not as strong as SmartStacks Pro, we're putting Poncho 1250 on all the VT4 Pros just as a little bit of a chemical backup to the traits. And it has uh, N314, which is our new nematicide in corn on there as well, come standard with the hybrid. So thank you to those that are trying 11499. You know, it's one of the hybrids that I bought for my own farm this year. Some people kind of turned their nose up on it because it wasn't in a lot of plots. We didn't have a lot of plot seed and it is one of the more expensive hybrids that we sell. And some people kind of balked at the price. Um, part of that price is that really expensive seed treatment that's on there um, and, and the yield potential that that hybrid, that hybrid brings. So I, I think that hybrid could be a big thing for us. And I think it'd be the first of a lot of SmartStacks pros that we bring out, or sorry, VT4 pros. It, it is a little bit hard for uh, people to keep track of the two because they both have pro in it. And I just caught myself making the same mistake that, that others make as well. So, um, so that, that's the three rootworm offerings. And then we continue to have the two above ground offerings of, of VT Double Pro, which we've had for years, and Tricepta, which we were in the process of, of moving to primarily for better earworm protection 
which is really, really, really needed more in the south than it is here. We have earworm. You see earworm damage every year. Earworm typically not going to ruin your corn crop in, in central Illinois unless we plant really late or it's kind of an odd year. But, you know, putting that Viptera trait in, which is, which is what makes it Tricepta, we pick up western bean cutworm, we got better black cutworm control, and we got perfect corn earworm control, and we're not really sacrificing, you know, anything with that additional trait in there. So Kevin Bergeson had a follow-up question, and I, I provided him with another follow-up question, but VT4 Pro on corn corn or stick to Smart Stacks Pro or Smart Stacks in Central Illinois? I followed up with how many years just okay. to get some clarity yeah. on that. But. Yeah, so, so the question is, basically, is, is VT4 Pro good enough to be used corn on corn? I think it is. Um, I would be cautious about using it on multi-year corn on corn, and especially if you've had a history of problems. If you've had a history of rootworm problems in your multi-year corn on corn, I, I would use SmartStax Pro. I probably wouldn't use smart stacks. There's not really a lot of advantage to smart stacks over VT4 Pro. That would be another indication of would VT4 Pro be okay with me. If you've been using smart stacks for years on your corn on corn and you've never had a problem, I'd be very comfortable with VT4 Pro replacing smart stacks on those acres. If you've had smart stacks in fields before, and you've still had more rootworm damage than you like to see, I would not be comfortable with VT4 Pro. You, you need to step up to SmartStacks Pro in that scenario. I don't think there's very many of those scenarios in central Illinois. They would be few and far between, but, but Cal Al and I do usually stumble across a field or two every year of SmartStacks corn on corn with maybe a node of roots pruned off, which is quite a bit of feeding. And, and if you've ever had that experience, I'd, I'd be careful with VT4 Pro corn on corn. What else, guys? This is working nice between you guys and the lot. Oh, we've got more coming in on the chat. Yeah. You, I, I don't know what it is, but you guys being here is making the chat more active today. So thanks for that. Our viewership is pretty high there. Okay. All right. Yeah. That people people were. Yeah, people were liking the live audience, so we got more people online just because. Get to fight with somebody or I yeah, who knows? Yeah. All right, Dave Dubin would like to ask, what are the best practices to stay proactive in preventing seedling diseases, both short term, this planting season, and long term, future planting seasons? Thanks, David, for the really simple, easy question. <laughs> um, so, so good, so good question. You, I think, uh, hopefully, everybody online heard it. If uh, if you didn't, it's basically what practices can we do to maintain seedling health? So, so first one we've already talked a lot about, and, and that's the number of days the seed has to survive in the soil before emergence. So getting your seed up as fast as you can, and, and I'm, and I'm going to ask you, what, what's one way you can make seed come up faster? How about if you shallow up your planting? So, so that's my biggest fear when I talk to people about we got to get corn up faster is they're going to plant it too shallow. Some people already plant too shallow, in my opinion. I don't really want to ever see corn much, much shallower than two inches. You know, inch and a half is probably enough. But if you're shooting for an inch and a half, you're going to have some that's at an inch. And, that, and that's too shallow. Um, now, if you're planting corn early and it's cold, you know, socking it in there two and a half, probably adversely helpful. So two inches ish is where I'd like to see corn planted. Now, now that we, we've got a, you know, there's kind of a big debate out there about what's the proper planting depth for corn. You know, that's one argument. But but the first argument we need to solve is your two inches is my inch and a quarter, and your two inches is my two and a half, and your two inches is my inch and three. We can't even decide on what two inches is. So, so it's a little bit difficult, a little bit subjective, and there's a difference, you know, do you measure from, you know, where do you measure from, you know, are you trying to account for soil settling that's going to occur after planting, you know, some people get really carried away, and, and I've been on complaints where I, I would have said the corn was planted an inch deep, and, and the customer I'm with claims he never plants shallower than two and a quarter, 
I'm like, but it's an inch. I, you know, how's that happen? You know, but it, again, he thinks it was planted at two and a quarter. I, I, I would beg to differ, but anyway, so, so somewhere around two inches is where I'd like to see it planted. It is true that it will come up faster with fewer heat units if you plant it shallower. But but don't don't do that. I my my old adage is if, if it's too cold to plant it two inches deep, it's too cold to plant. So if you're uncomfortable putting it in two inches because it's cold or because the forecast is shitty, then don't plant would be my recommendation. But um, so so assuming we're going in in good soil conditions, assuming we get that stand out of the ground healthy. Um, you know, our seed treatments help a lot. You know, there, there is a school of thought that this N314 nematicide that we've got, you know, what impact is root nibbling from nematodes having on the amount of crown rot infection we're getting in root systems? So there is some data that indicates some of our crown rot research has shown that in fields where we have more crown rot, we find more corn nematodes. So there is possibly a connection between nematode grazing and that root system being opened up for infection. So if we can come up with products that control nematodes, that, that might help. Um, some people are pretty strong believers in an early vegetative post-emergence fungicide. So like a V5 foliar fungicide to keep that root system healthy. Now that V5 fungicide, no matter which one you use, is not going to move from the leaf into the roots. Fungicides don't move like Roundup in a plant. So if you spray it on the leaf, it's going to protect that leaf. It might make that plant feel better. It's not moving to the root. So fungicides at V5, which I am a fan of, I do it at home on my own farm. I think we ought to do it on every acre. I acknowledge they don't always pay. But like any fungicide application, I think over time, I think it will pay. Um, they do tend to improve plant health, but they're not doing it by moving into the root system and killing crown rot in, in the roots. Um, you know, population is, is another factor. So there's a pretty strong correlation between the amount of crown rot you see in a field and the seeding rate. And unfortunately, the thicker you plant, the harder you push a field, the more you're trying to get out of it, the more likely you are to have crown rot. That's kind of the, the, one of the crappier things about crown rot. Um, if, if we would back off and quit trying to raise 300 bushel corn, we'd have less crown rot. And the reason for that is that the infection is going to happen probably no matter what. The amount of stress that that plant's under during grain fill is what causes it to either be in the root and not really cause a problem or blow up and kill the plant prematurely and cause lots of cannibalization and lots of yield loss and lots of standability issues, which we saw that last year. Um, we saw that primarily in areas that stayed driest through grain fill. You go to where Jennifer's family farms in Warren County, where after June 29th, it was really never dry. No crown rot, basically. Best corn in the state. 200 and, you know, kind of first liar doesn't have a chance kind of corn year for those guys. I mean, you know, if, if you wanted to brag about your 285, better keep your mouth shut because you're going to look like you don't know what you're doing. Uh, really, really good corn. Um, and, and very healthy. You guys, at the same time, had stuff that was dead as a post by September 1st that made 220, 30, you know, pretty good corn considering, but it would have been probably 250 or 260 if it hadn't died early. And, and what killed it off early was poor, poor root health from, from crown rot. Um, the, the biggest thing, you know, and Cal, I'll give, I'll give my colleague, Chris Cal, credit for this. He's, he's done more research than, than most people looking at treatments for crown rot. We've looked at Inferro, we've looked at V5, we looked at every product you can put in Inferro. He's got a special plot planter that's, that's set up with a nice system to put stuff in Inferro. We've looked at seed treatments. Um, we haven't really looked at, at our N314. 
uh, very much in, in these trials because it wasn't available when we did a lot of this work. We've looked at V5, we've looked at VT applications, we've looked at lots of different stuff. Um, the, from a treatment perspective, the single most effective treatment at preventing crown rot, and this will surprise you because crown rot infects the plant, we think probably when it's pretty small, kind of like sudden death in soybeans, gets into the plant early. You don't see the problem until later, but it gets in the plant early. The single, you know, compared to, we've looked at every product you can put in furrow. We've looked at V5 fungicide. We've looked at all timings of fungicide. The number one treatment we've tested for preventing crown rot is a VT fungicide, which at first didn't make a lot of sense because by that time, crown rot's already in the plant. That is not doing a damn thing to prevent the crown rot pathogens from infecting the root system. But it does a lot to reduce stress on the plant and it does a lot to keep the plant healthier later in the season and keeping the factory healthier and alleviating stress on the plant helps to suppress how bad of a disaster crown rot turns into. So, you know, I, I think those are several things that we have observed, you know, hybrids make a difference too. We're doing a lot of work today. We've, we've looked at a lot of different treatments and none of the treatments were a silver bullet solution to crown rot. Probably the closest thing we have to a silver bullet solution to crown rot is we need to make hybrids that are more resistant to crown rot. And, and we know they exist. We, we just need to do a better job identifying them and promoting them to the people who insist on planting black ground in early April. Because the, the, the crown rot environment is high organic matter soil, planted early, cold and wet. If, if you want to make crown rot happen, farm that way. Now, if you wait till sometime in May, I'm going to say, you know, May 5th, May 10th, I see very little crown rot in plant in corn planted after May 5th. And I see very little crown rot again, kind of like sudden death, you know, the, the soils that are the worst for crown rot, are also the soils that are worse for sudden death. And there's probably a reason for that. Both, you know, one of the primary causal fungal agents in crown rot is fusarium. And SDS is caused by fusarium. Now it's a different fusarium, but the environment that those two diseases like is kind of the same. So lighter, lower organic matter soils also have less crown rot. So if you farm a lot of, you know, if you're raising a lot of corn on timber soil, that's not where you're going to see your crown rot. It's going to be on the $20,000 an acre stuff. It's going to be on the 475 cash rent stuff. It's going to be on the stuff that you're counting on to make 280 is where crown rot's going to, going to get you. The back 40 on timber soil that, you know, grandpa paid 230 an acre for. 40 years ago that you're hoping makes 220, you won't have crown rot there. So recognizing the environments that tend to favor it and managing those environments accordingly is probably the best solution we have today. And we are starting some really, really, really intensive screening work in the breeding program to try to identify germplasm that has higher tolerance because it does seem to be whether it's the environment, the pathogens, our management, the genetics, I, I don't know what it is, but a lot of people feel that it seems to be getting worse. And, and, and in this part of the world, this will be a little bit of a controversial statement for some people, in this part of the world, it's a bigger damn deal than tar spot. And there's been a lot of interest and a lot of fear and a lot of discussion, a lot of stuff related to tar spot. Crown rot's a bigger problem for you guys than tar spot is. And unfortunately, it's harder to fix. If you're willing to aggressively spray fungicide through the summer and use good products at high rates and multiple applications if you need be, you can make tar, tar spot be a non-thing. You, know, you can't spend money and eliminate crown rot the way you can spend money and eliminate tar spot. What else, guys?
What's that? Already? And time goes fast. Probably less so for you guys than me, you know. I'm thinking, wow, it's been an hour already, and these guys are like, shit, feels like three hours to me. So. Thank you. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate you coming this morning, and appreciate the all the great questions online. So, so really good episode of Ask the Agronomist, and it can't be me that caused that because I do all of them. It must have been you guys. Uh, so, thanks for thanks for coming. Appreciate all the questions. We'll be back in two weeks, which is when. April 18th will be our next episode. I don't know if it'll be, you know, back in the studio like we normally are or if somebody will volunteer to host the next one. You know, a April 18th, hopefully we're all really damn busy. But uh, who, who knows with the, with the weather. So um, appreciate it again. And uh, everybody uh, have a great spring, hopefully. Stay safe. And uh, we'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks. First, uh, First applause on an acid agronomist. That's cool. <laughs>